Our guest tonight is a writer, editor, and lecturer. He's the author of several historical books and articles for nu numerous magazines. Tonight, he'll talk about his second book, Presidential Landmarks, which he wrote with his father. You may also have seen him, as I mentioned last year, when he presented um, Law and Order Boston for us. Please welcome David Crew. Good evening. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you, Judy. Um, so yeah, it all began uh, when I was growing up on Long Island and my dad's favorite president was Teddy Roosevelt. And it, we lived on the South shore of Long Island, but on the North shore was Teddy Roosevelt's a home in Sagamore Hill. So I, we must've gone there about half a dozen times. It was a fantastic place to go. And after my first book got published, my dad said, we should write a book about presidential landmarks. and Dad's a pretty, was a pretty persuasive fellow. And that's what we did. And this book came out in 1992. Far too many presidents go through all of them. But I thought what would be fun is tonight we will look at the presidents who were born here in New England and their landmarks, their birthplaces, and other associated uh, places associated with their presidency. Just so you know, I'm going to stop my video so we can all focus on places like this. The home on Franklin Street, which was the birthplace of John Adams in Quincy on October 30th of 1730. Now, John's dad wanted him to be a minister, but after Harvard, he decided to take up the law. He moved to this bigger home next to his birthplace at 141 Franklin Street in 1764 when he married a woman named Abigail. This was a bigger home much more uh, larger home. He needed room for his law office and a new son, John Quincy, who was born in 1767. And we'll of course hear a bit more about John Quincy shortly. This is the home in which Adams drafted the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, which became a model for constitutions of other states. It was the Stamp Act, which in part motivated John's participation in the Sons of Liberty, but despite his commitment to the growing revolution, John was also an unflinching believer in basic rights for all. And for those of you who saw my talk last year on law and order in Boston, we talked about the Boston Massacre and how it was John Adams who defended the commander of the British troops involved in that incident. He was a delegate to the Continental Congress, helped draft the Declaration of Independence, and he later negotiated the peace treaty with the British. And then he became our first ambassador to Britain. Talk about taking one for the team. He served as Washington's vice president, a job he considered to be insignificant. And in 1796, in our country's first true presidential campaign, he squared off against Thomas Jefferson. Now, the election ended up in Congress where an attempt to place Jefferson in office backfired. And so Adams, a Federalist, became president and Jefferson, his vice president. If you can imagine Joe Biden as president and Trump as his vice president, you get a sense of why we needed the 12th Amendment. Public sentiment was for war with France at this time. They were attacking our shipping and impressing our, our merchant seamen. And some French officials had attempted a bribe of American diplomats in the infamous XYZ affair, which was, uh, uh, in, as you can see in this a political cartoon, which is this representing. But Adams felt it was too soon for the young country to go to war and he negotiated the peace, which added to his growing unpopularity. During those problems with France, he signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which made it unlawful to write or speak anything that was false, scandalous, or malicious against the government. I mean, basically, that's what the internet does today. Anyway, this left a bad taste in the public's mind about Federalists in general, and Adams in particular. John Adams would be the first president to live in the White House. It is said that his wife, Abigail, used to hang laundry in one of the rooms during the cold weather. At that time, there were only 150 employees of the US government. 
Now, I used to say at this point in my speech that John Adams lived to see what no man since had seen, which is a son in the White House. Of course, we'll talk about the New England connection that forced me to change my speech a little later on. John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son, had quite a boyhood. His acquaintances, including Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and Thomas Jefferson. And by the time he was 12, he and his father had run the British blockade four times on their way to Paris. John Quincy Adams graduated Harvard in 1787. A bright and talented man, he nevertheless is proof that our fathers were right when they said, it's not what you know, but who you know. George Washington, whom his father served as vice president, appointed John Quincy to be minister to The Hague. And then his own father appointed him to be our country's first ambassador to Prussia. Then James Madison, another contemporary of his father's, appointed him to be our first ambassador to Russia. And while minister to Russia, he helped negotiate the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the War of 1812. While in London, serving as American Consul in 1795, John Quincy met a 20-year-old English-born woman named Louisa, whose father was an American businessman, and they married two years later. While serving here in London, he also helped draft the Monroe Doctrine and negotiated the adams onis Treaty in which Spain ceded claims to territory east of the Mississippi. So he comes back home. He's got tons of foreign policy experience. He wins a four-way race for the presidency. When Henry Clay threw his support and electors to Adams's way, when Adams turned around and made Henry Clay Secretary of State, Andrew Jackson, one of the losers, was furious. He called it a corrupt bargain, quit the Senate, and spent the next four years running for president again. For such a nimble and successful foreign diplomat, it's surprising how bad he was at domestic politics, which was becoming more and more toxic as sectional pressures between the North and South grew. After a drubbing at the hands of his former rival, Andrew Jackson in the 1828 election, Adams left few accomplishments other than reducing the national debt, and get ready for it, from $16 million to $5 million. And so John Quincy Adams, like his father, became the second president to serve only one term. I like to try to find amusing anecdotes about presidents where it's possible. Uh, this is kind of a cute one. He was, he was fond of a pre-dawn nude swim in the Potomac. Uh, and there was an enterprising female reporter by the name of Anne Royal, who very much wanted an interview with the president. And he simply either didn't have the time or didn't want to be bothered with a female reporter. So she, knowing of his uh, pre-dawn nude swim, literally sat on his pile of clothes and refused to get up and let him get out of the water and dress until she agree he agreed to grant her an interview. Now, here's probably the most amazing thing about John Quincy Adams. In 1830, he was asked by his neighbors if he would run for Congress. See how much this statement stands up the test of time. Quote, no person could be degraded by serving the people as a representative of Congress. We'll move on. <laughs> but Adams would become the first and only president to serve in the House of Representatives after leaving our nation's highest office. And he served 16 years there, gaining the nickname Old Man Eloquent for his anti-slavery positions, which also gained him an equally powerful nickname from the Southerners, who called him the madman from Massachusetts. He was there on the floor of the House of Representatives where he was struck with paralysis and died on February 23rd, 1848. Now let's look at the Adams home here in Quincy in some detail. The original section, which is along the front, was built in 1730 by Leonard Vassell, a sugar planter from Jamaica, who by the way, also owned a 
splendid mansion in a place called Scully Square in Boston. It was named Peacefield by John and called the Old House by the family members. And this family lived there until 1927. It's not, it's not what is called a period house as furnishings were added by John, John Quincy and other Adams family members when they each returned from overseas duties. This is known as the long hall and this exquisite wallpaper was brought back from Italy by John Adams during one of his many trips to the continent for our country. In this home lived several generations of the Adams family. Peacefield is surrounded by a magnificent garden. And if you visit, you're encouraged to stroll the grounds. Inside a separate building is this library with all the books that you can see there carefully indexed and sorted by Mr. Adams. The tombs of John Adams and his wife, Abigail, as well as John Quincy and his wife, Louisa, are in the crypt of the United First Parish Church here in downtown Quincy. It is the only edifice in the country that is the burial place of two presidents and their wives. Now, can anyone, uh, we're not doing raising hands here, so I'll just say, how many of you know who our next New England born president? He also happens to be New Hampshire's only native son to reach the White House, and that is Franklin Pierce, who was born in Hillsborough on November 29th, 1804. He attended the Bowdoin School with Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He first got involved in politics to help his father get elected governor in 1828. In 1829, Franklin became a state legislator, later Speaker of the House. In 1834, he became a U.S. congressman and after two terms in the House, was elected to the Senate. And then in 1842, he gratefully returned to New Hampshire and proceeded to turn down office to be interim senator, sit in James Polk's cabinet, and be governor of New Hampshire. He did enlist to fight in the Mexican-American War. He rose from private to brigadier general in just a year, serving with Ulysses Grant, Winfield Scott, Robert E. Lee, and Jefferson Davis. In 1852, Franklin Pierce became America's second dark horse candidate when a deadlocked Democratic convention, desperate for a candidate, who was inoffensive to as many people, chose Pierce, who had safely been out of politics, so frankly, <laughs> nobody knew what he thought. He never really expected, nor did he want to win. In his inaugural address, he said, quote, I have been born into a position so suitable to others rather than desirable to myself. Franklin Pierce is what we call a doe face. He was a northerner, with Southern slaveholding sympathies. He, he hated the abolitionists and saw nothing wrong with the expansion of slavery. As a matter of fact, he wanted to add Cuba as a slaveholding state. Now that never happened. He did approve the Gazden purchase from Mexico for $10 million. But here's where Pierce ran into problems. When part of the Louisiana territory is split into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska, each got to hold a territorial election. When Kansas held its election, thousands of pro-slavery Missourians crossed the border and helped elect a pro-slavery legislature. When the Kansas governor tried to disqualify them, Pierce overrode him. And this led to an explosion of violence known as Bleeding Kansas. By trying to expand the union, maintain the peace, Pierce managed to tick everybody off, Northerners and Southerners alike, and he failed to win his party's nomination for a second term. Once one asked what a president should do after leaving office, he replied, quote, there's nothing left to do but get drunk. Pierce said he supported the Union cause, but he denounced Lincoln's administration as cruel and oppressive and he called the Emancipation Proclamation unconstitutional. This is the Pierce homestead built by Camp 
Captain Benjamin Pierce the year his son was born in 1804. Benjamin had served with Washington in the Revolutionary War, but when he arrived here in Hillsboro in 1784, he was practically impoverished. But in 20 years, he became a prominent statesman and public servant and rich. It became Franklin's home in 1842. Pieces in the home, like this couch, actually sat in the White House, as did the cabinet, which sits below a copy of Pierce's official White House portrait. The kitchen features hand stenciled imported wallpaper restored to its original cover color. Uh, folks, this is a period house. All the furnishings are from the time that Franklin Pierce lived here, including this shaker bed. Notice the ropes at the end of the box where the mattress sits on. Now that, those are ropes. And after the bed got slept in for a few years, those ropes would start to stretch out. So there was a tool they had. It kind of looked like a fork with two tines. And you stuck the tines in between the ropes and the, uh, the box, the frame, and you twisted the ropes to make them tighter. And that, folks, is where we get the expression, sleep tight. On the second floor of the Pierce homestead was this ballroom, which was used not only for community dances, teas, and other social occasions. It's also where Captain Pierce would drill his regiment. So here's the one amusing story, if you will, about uh, Franklin Pierce. He was terribly shy which makes his elevation to the presidency even more remarkable. And, uh, but he was a handsome young lad. And so there were a lot of Hillsborough women who wanted to get his attention. One, knowing of his pension for taking that sleigh on a ride, stood by the side of the road without her wrap, standing there freezing and cold and shivering, assuming that the gallant Captain Pierce would pull over and offer her a ride and she could get to know him. He was so shy that he literally drove right past her, leaving her very cold and bitter, uh, taking a very cold walk home. Franklin Pierce died in October of 1869 and was buried in Concord in what is called the Monat Enclosure. He was so reviled for his Southern and slaveholding sympathies that it wasn't until 1914 that a statue was erected in his memory in front of the New Hampshire State House here in Concord. Okay, our next New England born president. His name was Chester Arthur. And he was one of two presidents born in one of the country's least populated states, Vermont. He's also, for reasons you'll find, one of my favorite presidents. Chester Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont in 1830. Later, when he would be nominated for the vice presidency, there was a 19th century version of the birther controversy, which was just as bogus as the one that hounded President Obama. Although political enemies tried to prove otherwise, all evidence supported an American birth and not a Canadian birth as his enemies proclaimed. And you can see how close his birthplace was to a border, which tended to be a little fluid up there in the Northwest Kingdom. Chester Arthur taught penmanship at the same school. And this is an amazing piece of historical uh, coincidence. Three years later, James Garfield would also teach at that school. Chester read the law, was admitted to the New York Bar in 1854, and then gained a reputation as a champion of civil rights. And I'll bet none of you knew that. He was a lead attorney on a landmark decision, the Lemon Slave case, that allowed Blacks coming to New York State to be free. This began his rise to the presidency, which until he was elected vice president, would all be jobs that were appointed. You see, our friend Chester A. Arthur was what many today's newspaper columnists would call a hack. He was 
uh, a guy who was always getting appointed to one position or another, starting with his appointment as quartermaster of New York during the Civil War, and then his post-war job as collector of the Port of New York. All of these he got as part of the infamous spoil system. It was a source of jobs, and jobs meant votes, and that's how the world went around. So the stalwarts, so named for their continued support of the spoil system, were led by a fellow named Roscoe Conklin of New York. Conklin and his cronies wanted James Blaine of Maine as the party's candidate in 1880. Now, the reform wing of the party, they were known as the half-breeds, they were furious. First of all, <laughs> Blaine was an idiot. I mean, one of the most uh, egregiously poor uh, uh, people to ever occupy a, a political office in this country, and that's saying a lot. So um, what they did was they... Where's my picture? Oh, I was supposed to have a picture of the guy they did finally choose, a former general of the Union Army, James Abram Garfield of Ohio. Like many successful political candidates, Garfield's position was hard to pin down. He was an early supporter of Blaine, but some of his votes in the House, where he served nine terms, also showed some half-breed tendencies. And so he was placed at the head of the ticket. But to placate the stalwarts, because Garfield was not 100% stalwart, they needed a suitable candidate to balance the ticket. And that's, where, oh, there's, there's my buddy Garfield. Let me just go back. There he is, James Abram Garfield. So to placate the stalwarts, they had Chester Arthur who had held that collector of Port of New York job from 1871 until 1878. That's when a Republican president, a guy named Rutherford B. Hayes, attempted to reform the Custom House, starting with the ouster of Chester Arthur. So Arthur becomes like a martyr for the stalwarts. He's the perfect candidate because he'd suffered at the hands of the reformers. So Garfield and Arthur win, win the, uh, the election, and everybody is happy. Well, except for James Guiteau, a disturbed itinerant lawyer, writer, preacher, and politician who felt slighted when his efforts on behalf of Garfield's candidacy were not rewarded. On July 2nd of 1881, he shot Garfield, famously declaring, quote, I am a stalwart and Arthur is now president. You see, everybody thought that now that Arthur was president, the spoil system was locked in place. It was going to be a feeding frenzy. Um, as seen in this political cartoon of the day, everybody thought Arthur would just start handing out the spoils because they had their man in office was going to stop all this reform nonsense. And now comes the part that makes Chester Arthur one of my favorite presidents because the stalwarts were in for a shock. Arthur, deep down, was a reformer at heart. Over the remainder of what should have been Garfield's term of office, Arthur became a champion of civil service reform. This 1885 Puck cartoon depicts President Arthur as a courageous lion and shows other politicians as monkeys throwing mud and other things at his civil service reforms. If you know what monkeys throw, then you get the joke. Um, Arthur investigated tariff corruption, pursued corruption cases like the Star Root mail frauds in which post office officials and contractors were, and a former senator conspired to obtain congressional appropriations for new and useless routes. Arthur used surplus revenues to lower taxes and bring down the national debt. He began the construction of four steel cruisers the beginning of America's modern naval fleet. Arthur sought construction of steam-powered steel cruisers, steel rams, and steel-clad gunboats like the USS Charleston. So, with all this reform activity, it should come as no surprise that Arthur had no success securing the nomination for a second term. Although we later learned 
that poor health had dulled his enthusiasm for the job. The nomination went to the notorious stalwart James Blaine, a pick so bad it led to the election of the first Democratic president since before the Civil War, Grover Cleveland. Chester Arthur's actual birthplace had fallen into disrepair. By the 1900s, nothing was left but a foundation. And so for many years, all there was to mark the site where a president was born was a simple granite marker. But in 1954, the Vermont Division for Historic Preservation rebuilt the house from an old photograph, and they filled it with period furnishings and tell the story of his early days in rural Vermont. Chester Arthur is buried here at the Albany Rural Cemetery in Menons, New York, his adopted state. Okay, now I think everybody's been waiting to hear about our next New England president. <clears throat> so I've been living in New England since 1980, which according to local custom makes my daughter a tourist. And I've come to love this part of the country. And so it should come as no surprise that another one of the presidents I enjoy speaking about is the man often described as a classic New Englander John Calvin Coolidge. This is the center of the Plymouth Notch Historic District in central Vermont, the birthplace and boyhood home of our nation's 29th president. And it's virtually unchanged since the turn of the last century, or the century before that. <clears throat> the house on the left side of our screen was for five generations until 1876, the Coolidge family residence. This bedroom was located on the first floor of that building and was on July 4th, 1872, the birthplace of our only president to be born on the 4th of July. The building's been extensively restored to look just as it did in 1872 with the original furnishings donated by the Coolidge family. Now, <laughs> that was, I think, in the 1930s or 40s they did that which tells us a great deal about the Coolidge family, that they had saved 100 plus year old furniture. Across the street, visitors to Plymouth Notch can find a working general store, complete with penny candy, which unfortunately today probably costs a buck. Coolidge Hall, which was used by the local Grange and for weekly dances, much like the hall in the Pierce home was in Hillsborough. This became Coolidge's summer White House office in 1924, and features an exhibit on how Coolidge's presidency affected the people of Plymouth Notch. And I'll give you the quick answer. It didn't affect him very much. When Calvin was four, the family moved to the homestead and he lived here until 1887 when he entered the Black Rover Academy here in nearby Ludlow. He then went to Amherst College and afterwards he studied and practiced law here in Northampton. He likely spent much of his time here at the Northampton City Hall. Calvin Coolidge was once asked what his hobby was, and he replied, holding office. And given his steady rise through the ranks, that was no joke because he started his public career as a city councilor here in Northampton, then became city solicitor, clerk of the court, state legislator, mayor of Northampton, state senator. <gasps> Lieutenant Governor, and finally Governor of Massachusetts in 1918, just in time for the Boston police strike of 1919. It was during that crisis when he spoke words which would catapult him to the vice presidency. There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, at any time. And in post-World War I Red Scare, the Bolsheviks are hiding behind every tree he became a symbol Republicans could exploit. And they nominated him to be vice president with dark horse Warren Harding. Coolidge was in Plymouth Notch when early on the morning of August 3rd, 1923, word reached the homestead that the president, Warren Harding, had died. Now, there is no law requiring that Coolidge should take the oath of office, but they needed to establish the continuation of the tradition. And so his father, who was a notary republic, would in this room uh, give his son the oath of office. 
Up to that point, it had been known in the family as the sitting room, but in that moment on, would be known as the oath of office room. And many of the furnishings and also the Bible and kerosene lamp that were used on that historic night are still there. Finishing up Harding's term, Coolidge rooted out much of the corruption that probably would have doomed Harding's chances for a second term anyway. And in 1924, Republicans asked America to keep cool and keep Coolidge, which they did, electing him to the office of president in his own right. The business of America is business, Coolidge once said, and his administration was filled with business leaders who weakened the regulatory agencies set up by Roosevelt, Wilson, and Taft. Ironically, a great deal of the money saved from tax cuts for the wealthy went into the stock market, which was enjoying unprecedented growth during the 20s, but would soon collapse and take those savings with it. In 1928, Coolidge announced he would not run for a second term. What it took us 50 years to find out was that he had suffered a heart attack in 1927 and was advised not to run for health reasons. Okay. Which, by the way, when, when we found this out, it absolutely blew my mind because we know so many details of our president's health. I mean, anybody remember the details of Carter's hemorrhoids? And yet we didn't know that a president had suffered a heart attack in the White House. After leaving office, Coolidge and his wife, Grace, returned home to Northampton. But there was so much tourist activity, as evidenced here by the crowd who had shown up to welcome them, that they moved to another more secluded home. Both Coolidge homes in Northampton are privately owned and no visiting is allowed. But you can go to the Forbes Library, where the Calvin Coolidge Memorial Room has mementos, correspondence, photographs, and other material relating to Coolidge's public career. Mr. Coolidge passed away in 1933 and was buried across Route 100A from his beloved homestead. It is as simple and unassuming as Coolidge himself. He was known for being taciturn, tight-lipped, and was once given the nickname Silent Cal. Yet the truth is, Calvin Coolidge held more press conferences than any president up to that time, and many more than some who would follow. But his theory was basically, if you don't say anything, you can't be called upon to repeat it. Um, one of my favorite Coolidge stories is about when he's sitting in the Mass State Legislature and another legislator is going on with a long-winded speech. Mr. Speaker, it is blah, blah, blah. Mr. Speaker, it is blah, 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 blah. Mr. Speaker, it is blah, blah, blah. Finally, Coolidge stood up. And all he said was, Mr. Speaker, it is not. The successor in the governor's office was a fellow named Channing Cox. And when Calvin Coolidge came back to visit, he visited Mr. Cox, who asked him how the vice president was able to see so many people when he was governor and yet still leave the office at 5 p.m. when Cox himself had to stay late into the night. Coolidge's response was, your problem is you talk back. Okay, we have three New England presidents left. And who's going to be next? More than almost any other political family, perhaps none has been studied and dissected more than the one that gave us the 35th president of the United States, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. He was born here at 83 Beale Street in Brookline in a home bought by his father, Joseph, just before his marriage to Rose in 1914. John was actually born in this room, the second of four sons, on May 29, 1917. Many births, most births, took place at home, and that midwives would use the room with the most light, which in this case was Rose and Joseph's bedroom. John was a sickly youth and spent a great deal of time in this bed, and yes, that is John Kennedy's teddy bear sitting on that rocking chair. When John was four, the family moved to this home on Abbotsford Road, also in Brookline, where they lived until 1927, when Joe moved them to New York. John attended Canterbury, then Choate Prep Schools. 
He afterwards went to Harvard. Anyway, he was with the graduating class of 1940. He was star studied. Imagine a class with John Kennedy, Jack Lemon, Pete Seeger, Donald Regan, William Proxmire, and Alan J. Lerner. With the US entry into World War II, John joined the Navy and was given the rank of ensign and commander of the PT-109, a patrol boat that was sunk near the Solomon Islands after being rammed by a Japanese destroyer. His older Joe having been killed in the war, it fell on John to pursue his father's political plans. And in 1946, he ran for and won a seat in the House of Representatives. This seat, once held by James Michael Curley, would one day be occupied by his nephew, Joseph. The 1952 senatorial election was something of a political payback as John beat Henry Cabot Lodge, whose father had beaten John's father for the same seat back in 1916. In 1960, after a grueling campaign in which his young age, he was only 42, and his religion, he was Catholic, had to be addressed, Kennedy won the Democratic nomination and the right to face Republican Richard Nixon in the general election. A campaign noted for the series of televised debates with Nixon that are credited with helping Kennedy win the election. His administration could not have started on a worse note as he approved a half-assed plan for the invasion of Cuba using Cuban exiles with generous help from the CIA, known as the Bay of Pigs, the 61 coup attempt was a total disaster. Just two months later, Kennedy was scheduled to meet with the Soviet dictator Khrushchev in Vienna. But despite the tension, Kennedy's wit was in full force. At the meeting, Kennedy is said to have asked the Soviet dictator what the medals on his chest were for. You know, the Soviets, they're always wearing these stupid medals on their coats. Well, Khrushchev began ticking them off. He, you know, this one is for agriculture, this is one is for party leadership, and this one is for peace. At which point Kennedy said, hmm, let's hope you get to keep that one. In August of 1961, a wall between East and West Berlin was built by the Soviets, further escalating tensions between the US and the Soviets. The height of the Cold War, at least as far as we know, came in 1962 when uh, high altitude photographs revealed the Soviets were installing nuclear tip ballistic min missiles on the island of Cuba, just 90 miles from the US shore. Kennedy played a game of nuclear brinksmanship enforcing a blockade of Cuba. And after 10 days, Khrushchev blinked, removing the weapons. Kennedy used his newfound prestige to get the nations of the world to sign a nuclear test ban treaty in August of 1963. And as everyone knows, barely 1,000 days into his presidency, John Kennedy was killed on November 22nd of 1963 during an early campaign trip to Dallas, Texas. After much wrangling with the city of Cambridge, a library dedicated to John Kennedy was built here on Columbia Point in Boston. I.M. Pei's striking design employing a circle, a square, and a triangle make it one of the city's most distinctive buildings. Inside, you'll find a research library. Downstairs is a fantastic exhibit, which takes you through the 1960 campaign. You walk through the convention floor, then down a street in 1960 America, past the Kennedy campaign office, and then you get to sit and watch the inauguration of the nation's youngest president. They recreated the White House Oval Office, including a um, the uh, recreation of uh, Kennedy's desk. Other exhibits in the museum tell of JFK's vision for the space program, his war years, and his fight with the governors of several Southern states over segregation. The exhibit hall also features displays on Jackie Kennedy's days as our first lady. And there's a nice tribute to JFK's younger brother, Robert, who was slain during his quixotic run for the presidency in 1968. The exhibit delves into some of the controversies too that surrounded JFK, even as far back as 1946. The dream lives on as the theme of the last part of the exhibit in which visitors are treated to memorabilia about advances in the space program, 
civil rights, and relations with Russia. This chunk of the Berlin Wall stands as a tribute to Kennedy's resolve when Russia built the wall during his term of office. I highly recommend the JFK Library if uh, you're down in the city. Okay, we're down to two more New England born presidents. Our next one. Well, no matter who won the 1988 presidential race, Massachusetts would have sent its fourth native son to the White House. For both Democrat Mike Dukakis and Republican George Bush were born in Norfolk County, Massachusetts. Mr. Bush was born in this house in Milton on June 12, 1924, in a makeshift delivery room, just like Kennedy, set up on the second floor of this Queen Anne home. When George was a year old, his family moved to Connecticut. Mr. Bush was a World War II hero, his plane being shot down in the Pacific, and he barely evaded capture by the Japanese. He would attend Yale after the war. He was a pretty good first baseman. Uh, they said good field, not good hit, which he always hated. But he married the former Barbara Pierce in January of 1945. And after graduation, he entered the oil business in Texas. Did pretty well. And in 1962, he tried to begin his political career by being elected chairman of the Republican Party of Harris County. After failing to win a U.S. Senate seat in 1964, he won a seat in the House of Representatives, where he served two terms. He lost another bid for the Senate in 1970, losing to Lloyd Benson, but was appointed by Richard Nixon to be our ambassador to the UN in 1972. In 1973, at the height of the Watergate scandal, Bush would take the job as chairman of the Republican National Committee. Again, taking it for the team. His successor, Nixon's successor, Gerald Ford, would appoint George Bush as head of our liaison office in Peking, as the communist Chinese capital was then known. In 1975, he was brought home to take on the reins of the CIA. So with all of this really interesting experience, both domestic and foreign, he ran for the presidency in 1980, but lost the nomination to Ronald Reagan who turned around and asked him to be his vice president. They won twice and then in 1988 would run again for the presidency, getting the nomination and running against. Okay, well, let's, let's move on. Bush's term began with several domestic crises, including the savings and loan scandal. Internationally, Bush ordered troops into Panama to secure the rightful president in office when Manuel Noriega refused to accept the results of his country's election. Both major communist powers represented unique challenges to Mr. Bush, even for a seasoned diplomat as he. The Chinese government suppressed a student revolt in Tiananmen Square, while a remarkable series of events led not only to the fall of the Berlin Wall, but to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then in 1990, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein orders the occupation of the Persian Gulf nation of Kuwait. Bush orders U.S. troops into the region and then, using his diplomatic skills, puts together a multinational force backed by the U.N. Not an easy task to get that group to support anything that the U.S. supports. And after a brief war, Iraq was expelled from Kuwait. So with victory over tyranny and ratings in the polls at unprecedented levels, Bush looked like a sure winner for re-election in 1992. But a stubborn economy that Bush insisted would give way to recovery never did and became the main issue between Bush and Democratic challenger Bill Clinton and Reform Party founder Ross I'm All Ears Perot. A 1988 campaign speech in which Mr. Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes. Well, <laughs> that came back to haunt him after he signed the 1990 budget, which included a tax increase. A few of the miscues, like this moment during one of the presidential debates when he's looking at his watch like he had better things to do, and Mr. Bush lost. But that lame duck presidency, that time between the election and the inauguration of his successor, was anything but lame and quiet with Mr. Bush calling for airstrikes against a recalcitrant, excuse me, recalcitrant Iraq 
and sending U.S. troops into the starving nation of Somalia to ensure the flow of relief supplies in a mission called Operation Restore Hope. The president's summer home, which has six bedrooms and six bathrooms, is located here on 11 acres of land on Walker's Point, a rocky peninsula off Kenny Bunkport's Ocean Avenue. It was the president's grandfather, also named George H.W. Bush, who had the home built back in 1903. It's a private home, no visiting is allowed. You can still view the home from Ocean Avenue, but I know from personal experience, don't stop and take pictures because the Secret Service really didn't like that. Okay, so when George W. Bush won the presidency in 2000, he forced me to make this change to my presentation. I had to add a new president to the show and I could no longer say that John Adams was the only president to see his son also elected to the White House. George W. was born in Connecticut on July 6, 1946, while his father was attending Yale. Yale must have been in his blood because George W. would also graduate from the school in 1968, and then he went to Harvard Business School. Like his father, he went into the oil business and then became a partner in a group that bought the Texas Rangers with the intention of building a dome stadium. Mr. Bush later sold his interest in the team and the dome never happened until very recently. Mr. Bush won two terms as Texas governor, but did not complete the second term, opting for and for the presidency in 2000. It took a couple of months, but after a discrepancy over votes in the swing state of Florida, the whole thing ended up in the Supreme Court. Bush was declared the victor and took office in January of 2001. We are under attack. Those four words spoken by Chief of Staff Andy Carr to the president on September 11th, 2001 would change America forever and challenge the new president in ways not matched since the dark days of Kennedy in the Cold War, Roosevelt in the Second World War, or Lincoln during the Civil War. The invasion of Afghanistan, the taking down of the Taliban, the invasion of Iraq to search for weapons of mass destruction, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, a new agency tasked with protecting the country, the opening of the prison at, prison at Guantanamo, and the challenges of an economy battered by the effects of 9-11, leading to the crisis of 2008 and the signing of the first stimulus bill by Mr. Bush. We've all seen how the presidency ages men. I mean, even Ronald Reagan started turning gray. It's a small wonder that anybody would want this job. But eight of them called New England their home all face great challenges, whether those of a new country or a growing world power or a country under attack. Some were more successful at the job than others, but surely all had the country's best interests at heart. And we should be grateful to them for even taking on the job. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention tonight. I think I'm gonna start my video again say hello again and um i guess we'll take some questions uh i know judy or carol one of you is gonna uh be my ed uh <laughs> your ed asner or no not ed. Uh, uh, um, mcmahon ed mcmahon thank you yes um so uh let me let me check the question manager but i i actually came up with a question myself um okay so for the, the two Adams houses, you never talked about them being um, a museum. And I just wondered, are, are they open to the public? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, so, so much is up in the air because of COVID. Uh, yes, the, the, the home and uh, the, it, has, it has been or was open uh, to the public. But I honestly, I don't know its status right now. So I recommend if someone is interested in going, you should definitely uh, check the web for uh, information on that. That's probably true for, for all of the... Uh, it's Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, there really was no other questions. There was a comment in there, but mm -hmm. thank you. But that's 
that's really it. So I don't know okay. if that's the um, question. Um, David, I think you mentioned at some point, not in the presentation, but earlier about a, a president that was almost lynched in New Hampshire. In New, that in would New be Hampshire? Mr. Pierce, yes. Um, uh, Jean, I got, I, I got to put that picture back. Thank you for reminding me. So um, the Civil War begins and uh, New Hampshire being a bastion of the Union cause uh, because of Mr. Pierce's dough-faced uh, positions, he was, uh, and also his public statements about his feelings about Lincoln and about the Emancipation Proclamation, um, a, a mob actually formed outside this guy's house with torches and, and with threats of, of being lynched. And um, in, in one of, and again, for a guy who was not a great public speaker, mm -hmm. uh, he, the, the story is that he stood on the porch of his home and he, he basically he said, you know, he, he, the, the basic idea was, you know, I stand four square with the union. I stand four square for the, the right of, of an American to speak his mm -hmm. mind. And mm -hmm. the, the lynch mob dispersed. Mm -hmm. wow. He saved himself. Yeah. yeah. Let me check here. All right. So... Someone wanted to point out that the Supreme Court did not declare Bush the winner. The Supreme Court ruled that selective recounts without uniform standards, as Gore and Lieberman were calling for, violated the 14th Amendment. Okay. Well, I, 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 stand, I stand corrected. Um, I used a shorthand that I should not have. Thank you very much for whoever brought that up. Good point. I'll make that clear next time I give this speech. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention, I, I don't know if you know about this, but do you remember when Reagan was running for president and there was a debate where um, there was some kind of controversy about who could be in the debate? Yeah, and then that was in your town. That was in yeah, Nashville. Yeah, that was in Nashville. Yes, and uh, that was the picture that I showed. It, it was a great moment. They, 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 um, it was and uh, Bush was up there on the stage. I forget who the other uh, Republican candidates running yeah. and and Reagan yelled at the guy who was wanted to take the microphone away and said, I'm paying for this microphone, Mr. Green. That was the great Reagan quote. And it was right. one of those things that just that, again, catapulted Reagan into the nomination. Yeah. And a, a little piece of trivia is I think he said Mr. Green, but the guy's name was actually Mr. Breen or something. That wasn't his oh, exact no. name. Well, yeah. Um, our, our librarians wrote a history of 30 years in Nashua, and that was oh. one of the stories. Oh, that's uh, that. but I know the Nashua the Telegraph Green. was yes. involved in that debate somehow, yeah. but I don't remember the details. Another uh, piece of little Nashua history is that um, John F. Kennedy started his campaign in Nashua in front of City Hall. Oh, so that's a little little. Tidbit. And there's a there's a Didn't bust it... of him out in front of, of City Hall, which um, actually got didn't it get stolen a few times, Judy? Yeah, um, yeah. No. Now they have it. Um, it. It used to just there was a bust, you know, just on a stand, and it was easy to access it. Now there's like a little fence around it, so it's much more okay. difficult. Well, be because your state, by law, has is always the first primary. There's a lot of candidates who started. The, I believe Jimmy Carter. You know, he's he he signed the papers to get himself on the ballot, and then he walked out and he walked up to someone and said, "Hi, I'm Jimmy Carter. I'm running for president." <laughs> Boom. So you know, your your town gets gets the gets the spotlight once every four years, doesn't it? It's fun. Yeah. yeah, I'll bet it is. But I bet it gets tiring real quick. <laughs> yeah. There's another question uh, someone has asked or commented. Um, I believe the possible lynching of Pierce occurred the night Lincoln was shot. Is this accurate? I have to check. Honestly, there was a slide. That, that, that I took the slide out and I know about the I know about the lynching story, but I I don't know. I have to look that up. Mm -hmm. I'd have to, I mean, I'm very sorry uh, not to have the definitive answer on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think also, if you remember when Ed, Ed Muskie ran, he, he ran oh, for yeah. the nomination, I think 72. And, yep. and 
that he dropped out and partly it was because he he was so upset by the way he was being treated i think by the union leader manchester the union well leader. yeah uh, the manchester Brian union leader something. yeah the uh, william Lowe wrote they had the, that was his paper and they wrote something i think about his wife and yeah, yeah. he it was snowing the story goes and snowflakes are falling on his cheek and some people oh. claimed he was crying and so that didn't help his uh his yeah. candidacy not that I anyone had a shot that was in nashua or manchester i think it was manchester okay yeah yeah well i got a lot of stuff to fix thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs> lots of people into President. I love it. No, that's great. <laughs> and I appreciate everybody. You know, that's keeping me honest. Yeah. yeah. Which is ironic when we're talking about politicians, but. <laughs> yeah. So, folks, thank you so much for, for having me tonight. I really appreciate yeah. it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for paying attention and asking some great questions and providing some great comments. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. We yeah. appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Good night, then. We'll see you Thank again. You Good night. Bye-bye.